Okay, so good evening. So welcome to another edition of NECA webinar. And so my name is Hua Wan. I'm a co-chair of New England Chinese American Alliance. You know, NECA has uh, put on many webinars uh, during the pandemic and since then, and the many of them are of, uh, you know, great interest to the community. And as we continue to, you know, offer such webinars, and tonight it's a great, great pleasure and to have an all-star lineup, as I said. So to start off, and uh, as you'll see from the flyer, right? So Professor Mike Devell will discuss a so-called an eventful and somewhat romantic life. And this is about young fully in America. So Professor Duvel is a professor of English at the College of Charleston. He's also the vice chair of the English department and his ac academic expertise and uh, interest area is in the English literature in the 19th and 20th century. And we'll let him talk about the story, why he got so interested in the life and the work of Yan Fo Li. And uh, Li is the first Chinese American to publish a book in the United States. And the book was titled, When I Was a Boy in China. It was published in 1887. While a student at the Yale College, of course, now it's called Yale University, Li deliberately cultivated himself as a voice for the Chinese Americans. And he wanted his writings to help correct misunderstanding of China and the Chinese people. So Professor Duvel will give an overview of this life in the US and will focus attention on this book and his writings against the hateful of violence, xenophobia rampant in the US at the end of the 19th century. Well, Lee's story is American story worth of attention and it has much to teach us in the 21st century as you know, currently, especially in the anti-Asian hate you know, the environment and the movement for all of us. So, and then we also have great pleasure to have uh, the great grandsons of uh, Yang Fo Li here, and that's Matt and Ben. So we'll let the professor develop to introducing them as well. Okay, so Mike, the stage is all you Thank you. Okay, thank you. I didn't prepare introductions for Ben and Matt. I, I know that they're uh, great grandchildren of Yang Fu Li and that uh, Ben is residing in China where he's uh, some kind of uh, grand poobah of uh, a school there and that Matt is an AP State Department reporter. Um, would you guys mind talking for just a couple minutes um, to kick us off? Sure, Ben, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> sure, you're actually in China. Maybe. I am. So good evening, everybody. And uh, this is a, a special opportunity for, for me and, and my brother, Matt, um, and actually our mom, Susan, who is on the call as well as a participant. So um, hi, mom, and hello uh, to hi, all, all of you. It's, uh, it's great to be able to be here. I also need to apologize at the outset because uh, I am uh, a high school principal in Shanghai. Uh, it's the uh, Shanghai American School. And uh, today is uh, one of our new teacher orientation days. So uh, I'll, I'll say a few words now and, and run out and then try and come back and catch as much of Professor Duval's talk as I can. Um, Matt and I both had uh, uh, the experience of, of traveling to China when we were uh, younger. And um, so uh, I think even though uh, our life paths have taken us in, in different ways, we we knew about our great grandfather from the time we were little um, and had a kind of uh, interest in China in the back of our minds at all times. As it happens, um, both of us have uh, embarked on careers that have uh, that have um, you know brought us in in, in touch with uh, with China in various ways. Um, uh, this is now my sixth year um, living uh, in China and, and working at Shanghai American School, uh, but I also lived uh, in Hubei, Wuhan. Uh, from wow. 1992 to 1994. Um, so I was teaching at that point at Huadong uh, Dashia. And uh, so my, my experience with China um, has been really lifelong and um, life-changing. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Matt and sign off for a little while. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Matt Lee. As uh, 
Uh, as you've heard, I, I am uh, the diplomatic correspondent, diplomatic writer for the Associated Press, which is something I've been doing since 2007. But before uh, that, before I worked for the Associated Press, I worked for the French news agency, uh, AFP, um, and I started working for them in Cambodia. So not, um, you know, not quite China, close enough, but obviously Cambodia has a, uh, a long and uh, somewhat tortured uh, history with, with China. Uh, but it's uh, clear, you know, from what, what Ben just said and, and my own experience, I mean, I spent almost five years in Phnom Penh, but also traveling around, um, that, uh, you know, there was an Asia pull uh, in, in this generation of uh, Lee Yan Fu's, uh, you know, his, in, this, of his, in this generation of his descendants. Um, uh, Ben's absolutely right. I mean, I, I've been to China. I mean, until things, uh, until diplomatic relations got so strained uh, beginning two or th three years ago, um, I've probably been to China with various secretaries of state, starting with Madeleine Albright, uh, probably at, at least a dozen times. Um, and that includes Beijing, that includes Shanghai, that includes Hong Kong, uh, both, well, after the handover, obviously, but uh, I was in Hong Kong but before the handover, that includes Chengdu, uh, I visited uh, Wuhan, um, uh, visited Changsha. Uh, so, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm not, I don't speak Chinese and I'm not nearly the expert at, uh, on it uh, as my brother Ben is, uh, but I have a, a pretty good sense um, uh, of, of, I think at least, uh, of the country. And I know that that's a trap that many in the West could fall into thinking that they know everything there is to know, or at least a, a lot of what there is to know about, uh, about China. And I don't claim to, to know that, but um, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's where we are. Um, uh, you know, it's been a particularly difficult time over the course of the last two years in U.S.-Chinese relations, uh, something that I've focused on um, quite a bit in my, in my work, simply because, you know, these are two major world powers and they're really just going head to head. Relations are bad, even though there was this meeting uh, or just over the weekend, um, uh, in Tianjin, you know, it, it doesn't look like things are going to get better anytime soon, which is, uh, you know, unfortunate on any number of uh, any number of levels. Uh, this does not <clears throat> only pertain to COVID uh, and questions about uh, the origins of it, but but also to more broad geopolitical things that are that are going on. Um, and the manifestation of the hostility in terms of the anti-Asian um, violence that we've witnessed in this in this country recently is, has been really quite unfortunate and led me, uh, I'm not able to take positions uh, on political issues given my, my job, but uh, I have pointed out through my Twitter feed and through other places, uh, you know, the story of of my great grandfather, of Ben and my great grandfather, um, and his appeal um, for the Chinese to be treated with dignity and, and Chinese in the States to be treated with dignity and respect going back to the, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So I'll, st I'll stop there. I went on for too long, but um, I'll stop there and I'm uh, you know happy to join the discussion or answer any questions. Okay, Mike, I just want to alert you, Susan is here, join us as a panelist. I, I so. can see her on the screen. Um, it's amazing to have uh, Ben and Matt and Susan Lee. That's just a bonus. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to um, take over the screen. And I hope what you're seeing on screen now is uh, the sort of cover slide of the presentation. Oops. Sorry, you know what? I think I just made it go away. Hey, this is just like teaching all, all last year. I've uh, tripped up already. All right, so bear with me for a moment.
There we go. Now, tell me uh, if somebody can indicate to me, do you see the, the presentation slide there? Yeah, we see it well. Great, thank you. Okay, so I will, uh, I will be talking about um, how I got interested in uh, Yan Fu Li and his work. Um, I'm gonna come to that. I do wanna start, however, um, with just saying uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, I want to express my deep gratitude uh, to NECA for allowing me the opportunity to talk about Jan Fuli and what I've learned about his life and what I've gathered from his my engagement with his life and work over the past couple of years. I'm humbled that uh, <clears throat> you have invited me to contribute in my small way to your organization's mission. I also want to thank in particular uh, Kathy Huang for reaching out to me and uh, sharing my enthusiasm with uh, of the study of Yan Fu Li and for being my constant companion over the past two days when we sent uh, slides back and forth so she could do the translations. I uh, also want to thank the descendants of uh, Yan Fu Li I've had the pleasure to meet and correspond with and now have seen faces of Ben Li and his brother Matt. Um, the great uh, great grandchildren of Jan Fuli, and especially Ben's daughter Trinity. I don't know if she's here. Who found me on the web? Uh, you know, uh, something that I had posted, and reached out to me and got this whole connection rolling. So, and I also just want to say quickly, as an academic, I think it's um, <clears throat> very easy to drift into abstraction about our subjects of study. But the interest and engagement of Kathy, the Lee family, <clears throat> and NECA help center and ground this work so, and give me energy to sustain it. So thank you for that. So I want to say a couple words about my institution before we get going. Uh, the College of Charleston is a public liberal arts and sciences institution located in Charleston, South Carolina, downtown in Charleston. And we've just celebrated 250 years last year. We have around 10,000 students. Um, we have undergraduate programs and graduate master's level programs. And we may be moving into PhDs in certain fields coming up soon. Uh, it's been a privilege for me to work here for the past 16 years uh, with terrific students and uh, dedicated faculty colleagues. Um, it's truly my home. Uh, still, this institution, uh, my home, benefits from legacies that I would now like to acknowledge. Our city uh, sits on the unceded lands of indigenous people of coastal South Carolina, including the Catawba, Chicorn, Chicori, Oyate, Edisto, Santee, Yamasee, Waccamaw, and Nachas Cucho. Cuso, sorry. And on the screen, you're seeing a Catawba map uh, from the 18th century, originally on deerskin. To the left, that's Charleston, that uh, grid of streets. And to the right on the bottom of the square is Virginia. This is a map, um, one of the rare uh, Native American maps from the period. The college is also on land that has long been stewarded by the Gullah Geechee peoples. Who are, whose forebears were enslaved on nearby Sea Island plantations that grew rice, indigo, and cotton. And on screen there, you see Queen Quet of the Gullah Geechee Nation pouring a libation to honor their ancestors, known and unknown, in a public park nearby. That park is adjacent to Gadsden's Wharf, one of several sites in the area where at least 40% of the enslaved people in what became the United States of America were bought and sold. Uh, here, here we see a late 18th century Charleston auction notice for sale and continued enslavement of human beings. Finally, our institution was also indeed built by enslaved people whose descendants were until 1967 actively barred from attending the school. Uh, this brick is from the College of Charleston. It's from a college building, and it bears the impressions of the fingers of its maker, quite probably an enslaved person. So at the College of Charleston, we strive to acknowledge these legacies, to pay respect to them, 
to study them, and we aim to actively work <clears throat> against the systems of oppression such legis legacies perpetuate to this day. Okay, so on to Yan Fu Li. Uh, Yan Fu Li, right, uh, an eventful and somewhat romantic life, Yan Fu Li in America. Uh, I just want to remark on the subtitle. Those are Yan Fu Li's words from an 1894 interview he did in the St. Louis newspaper, uh, in which he begins by, uh, so you want to know about my life? Well, it's, I'll say it's eventful and somewhat romantic. I love that because it's, um, it's characteristic of his style, it's understatement, it's sarcastic, actually. Um, when you know more about his life, you know that uh, he has this dry sense of humor and it's, uh, it's covering over a lot of territory. So Kathy asked uh, the first time I met with her on Zoom, what brought me, what captured my interest about Yan Fu Li. And um, it, it began with my teaching. I was teaching a course that I created um, and I've taught it uh, in different versions three or four times. I'll teach it again the year after next on late 19th century American literature of basically of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era in which I was trying to center the work of marginalized people or people that would be on the margins of an ordinary American lit course. So African-American writers, um, I'm going column by column here, Native American writers, uh, Eastern European immigrant writers, and Asian American writers. Now for Asian American writers in the late 19th century, there's very little. Um, I knew uh, I would add into the course, uh, Sui Sin Far, who that was the pen name of Edith Maud Eden because I had taught a number of her pieces in survey classes. I knew I would add her sister's work. Her sister went by a Japanese uh, pen name, Anato Watana. Um, Winifred Eaton, uh, but I had a kind of blank spot for, you know, who else to include. And after digging, I discovered, um, personally discovered, I didn't discover him, um, but yeah, uh, I became aware of Jan Fuli, never having heard of Jan Fuli. And that's pretty amazing for an American literature specialist because he wrote the first book published by a Chinese American in the United States. So I was working on um, putting together this course and I, and I found Yan Fu Li and, and worked that in. And this, the students love Yan Fu Li. I, I just wanna say one more thing though, the, the way the course works is we're comparing these different writers from different um, marginalized groups, uh, you know, across the columns there. And also we're taking into account uh, the cultural, historical and, and legal events that happen as well. So, uh, and we're looking at them as happening concurrently. So you have these kind of um, individualized oppressive measures for different groups, but they're all unfolding concurrently and they're intertwined. And the discussion that we can have when we put them into comparison is a really rich discussion. So uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, of course, in 1882 is the first um, US immigration law that excludes or parses out immigrants by nationality, race, and ethnicity. Um, and uh, initially it barred most, most immigrants to the United States from China, but had exceptions for students and um, merchants. And over the years, of course, uh, it kept being, you know, becoming more and more restricted. So we put that into play with the decimation and uh, forced assimilation of Native Americans in the West. You see an image there from Carlisle Indian School. The terrorism against uh, Black Americans uh, following on the end of Reconstruction in the South, but across the United States as well. And then finally, the oppression of, um, of Eastern European immigrants who are pulled to the United States at the end of the 19th century and over the turn of the century by the rapid industrialization and pushed by conditions in their homes as well, and equally codified as inferior beings <clears throat> in cultural and legal discourse. So that's kind of how I ended up um, finding this amazing book uh, by Yan Fu Li. 
I found it fascinating. My students find it fascinating. Uh, just to give you a thumbnail sketch, it's just over, if you haven't already read it, I hope you have or you will, just over 100 pages. It's 12, 12 chapters. And the chapters are as much anthropological as they are autobiographical. There it is, here we go. Lee, who tells us early in the text that he arranges his name now in accordance with American custom, covers such topics as the raising of children, family structures, household arrangements, gender differences, food ways, public markets, school life, storytelling, Chinese holidays, and the like. The book closes rather abruptly. Um, that's uh, one thing that people notice. Uh, there's no concluding chapter or even a paragraph that concludes. The final chapter is dedicated to giving details of his arrival in America in 1872 with his group of Chinese students from in the Chinese educational mission. It includes a harrowing story of their journey from San Francisco to Springfield, Massachusetts, which was interrupted by a violent gang of white bandits who robbed his train. We now know that was Jesse James, uh, and probably the first train robbery as well. As Lee tells us in his characteristic deadpan understatement um, of this incident, one phase of American civilization was thus indelibly fixed upon our minds. So this, this statement, which comes in the final chapter near the close of the book, gives the text a ragged feel. And um, it's a text that feels episodic at times and discontinuous if you're reading it. And if you're a reader who comes to the book looking, expecting a smooth unfolding of a autobiographical narrative of a, of a boyhood where incident leads to incident and we see development of a singular character, um, that if that's you as a reader, you might be disappointed or to take the better path, you might be intrigued. And uh, that's one of the things that intrigues me, what accounts for the nature of the book. And that question sustained me in my teaching and my engagement with Lee uh, for quite some time. Um, but I just happened through very dumb luck one day to be doing a Google search on a term in the book. And discovered that um, it was not actually written as a book. Lee didn't write it as a book. He wrote it as a series of articles um, for a children's magazine called Wide Awake. And his serialization of his 12 articles began in December, 1884. That's the cover you see there. And it went through um, November of the following year, 1885. Uh, the sources, I'll just show you the rest of the cover because I think it's cool. Sorry, bear with me. Um, the sources I had consulted, the critical sources, um, didn't even mention this. Everybody thinks it was written as a book. Um, but the fact of it not being written as a book, being written um, as a serial in a children's magazine opens up all kinds of questions, and, and it did for me. So... Uh, who were the readers for this magazine? What expectations were they bringing to the work? And um, the re are the readers, just, they're presumably children, but also are adults involved? Turns out, yes, adults were reading these magazines too. What other stories were they reading as they were reading this monthly unfolding of the life uh, and uh, life of Yan Fu Li and life in China? What else were they reading? Were his, his articles in dialogue with other articles in the same magazine? Were they in dialogue with other magazines? So that's where my inquiry started. And um, I did some work on that, did a presentation at American Literature Association on it. But pretty soon it turned, uh, that inquiry turned into more of one of who is Lee? So, you know, who was Lee and what was he trying to do? And perhaps more a more needful question, especially given the comments Matt just gave, um, who is Lee for us now? So what I have uncovered in my analysis of Lee's life is in part guided by and builds upon the earlier discoveries by the late Richard Lee, Matt and Ben's father, and um, who's who was Yan Fu Lee's grandson and uh, 
in his introduction, he spells out a lot of the history and also fills in some family history. And also the late Amy Ling, an important scholar of Ameri Asian American literature. Um, and what these sources and the ones that I've uncovered in my own work indicate to me is just how deeply uh, invested was Yan Fu Li in developing himself as a voice for the Chinese in America and in how deliberately he was cultivating himself as a writer and indeed as a public intellectual. Amy Ling speaks of reading between the facts of Lee's life and between the lines of his writings. That's a quote. Uh, my own work is continuing that analysis, that reading uh, by adding many more facts and many more of Lee's writings to the record and trying to grapple with those. Um, just a quick note on researching on Fuli. Uh, there's no single archive. <laughs> Would that there were. Uh, you end up, you know, I consult five or six different periodical databases, Google Books. Um, there are a couple collections I went to. His life is kind of scattered um, around many sources. Okay, so uh, just moving into the presentation. Uh, Yan Fu Li's name in pinyin is Lian Fu. Uh, there's his name in Chinese characters. Um, he opted to go with Yan Fu Li as his name, and I'm following that as well. He used Yan Fu Li for almost every single one of his publications and uh, in, for legal purposes as well. And he was in the United States for most of his life when you look at the, um, at the uh, time frames there. Okay, so uh, overview of the presentation, I'm going to be judiciously cutting as I go because I realized this afternoon rehearsing this, I have way more to say. And even then I'm thinking how much I'm leaving out. Uh, we'll talk about Lee's early life um, and in the uh, Chinese educational mission mainly. Uh, Lee's return to the US and his development of a personal mission. His, um, ex his writing while he was at Yale and his development as, as a writer, lectures, uh, professional writing, student writing. His life in the US after Yale, um, I will focus on the other side of the Chinese question, his uh, commencement address there, and a little bit of a postscript. Oh, and by the way, I should say, um, please, if you will, if you have questions, put them in chat, and I'll just rely on one of my fellow panelists to find questions. And at any time, you can interrupt me. Um, I'm probably not going to be monitoring the hand raising, but maybe one of the other panelists can tell me if there's a question. So we'll start with the early life and uh, early life of Li and the life in the Chinese educational mission. So Li was born in, um, and forgive my pronunciation, Zhangzhang, Guangdong province in 1861. That's on the west side of the Pearl River Delta. In his Yale records, uh, he's said to hail from Fragrant Hills, an English translation of his home. His grandfather was a scholar official in the Qing government, uh, according to Li, a literary sub-chancellor. And there's an indication that his father and uncle also had ambitions in this area as well. Li's unmarried uncle, who adopted him on his deathbed so that he could pass on his wealth to Yan Fu Li, he didn't have his own son, dies when Li is young and his father passes away when he is nine. Some three years later, a cousin approaches uh, Li and recruits him for the Chinese educational mission, which began in 1872 and can be thought of as an outgrowth of what has been called China's self-strengthening movement. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my slides didn't quite work. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, to avoid future military losses to European powers uh, that were bent on acquisition and resource extraction from China and to be prepared for internal unrest, such as what happened in the Taiping Rebellion later, uh, the Qing court engaged in an effort to develop military and civil in infrastructure of its own seeking to adopt technology of the West and making efforts to wean itself off of 
European and Western experts and technocrats. The CEM, Chinese Educational Mission, was largely the brainchild of Young Wing. There were other people involved as well. Uh, Young Wing had lived in the US for many years himself, graduating from Yale in uh, 1854. Uh, there's a statue of him on the campus at Yale, as a matter of fact. Also, I had read that uh, his contributions to Yale's library formed uh, the, the capability of them offering the first uh, professorship in, in Chinese history and culture. So um, the, the idea was simple. You would take these boys from China, um, you know, boys who passed qualifying exams and whatnot, and you would bring them to the US where they would live with American families in the Northeast, go to American schools, and eventually go on to earn college degrees, particularly in science, technology, and engineering, but also in the liberal arts, which is the path that Lee pursued. And with this uh, intimate knowledge of Western science, engineering, and technocracy, the young men were supposed to return to China and aid, take on leading roles actually in China's self-strengthening. That's Yang Wing. So they would attend uh, these American schools, but at the same time, they would be continuing instruction in Chinese uh, culture and religion conducted by Chinese adult supervisors. They were closely monitored to make sure that they didn't stray from too far into Western and American ways. But as you might guess, this kind of put them in an in-between situation. Here's a picture of the first detachment. Um, that's what they were called, detachments, groups of 30, I believe, before they leave China. Here's some pictures from after their arrival, just smaller groups. You can see how young these kids are, the way they're dressed, um, and, and all of that, and just sort of keep that image in mind as we move forward, and we'll, we'll talk about the pressures for Americanization and assimilation. So Lee, is, uh, his destination is Springfield, Massachusetts, where he and another child are taken in by the Vale family. He was so close to the Vales that he later named his third child, Clarence Vale Lee, uh, in their honor. Um, the Vale and Lee names continue to be passed on in that branch of the family. So he goes to school in Springfield for a while before relocating to New Haven, Connecticut to attend the Hopkins Grammar School. Uh, I found this map of Springfield interesting and just showing the kind of uh, the, uh, the amount of wealth and what sort of the, what the nature of that city was. This wasn't just a, a hole in the wall. This was a city with a number of manufacturing interests lots of churches, and uh, I overall seemed very politically progressive. So the Hopkins Grammar School, now just known as the Hopkins School because it's still around, um, and if you've got $42,000 a year to drop for your kids, you can, you can send your kids there too, maybe. It was a fairly exclusive preparatory school for colleges, uh, and it had a tight relationship with Yale College. Students who did well at Hopkins could transition effectively to Yale. And Lee did just that. He did very well at Hopkins. Um, and entered the, uh, what was then called the academical program at Yale in 1880. So here I have a, a sample of um, the kind of gushing, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, to sort of testify to that idea of how well he did. Uh, and this is T.P. Lee, who is a son. Wow, sorry about that, y'all. Okay, who was uh, one of the Vale's sons. I'll tell you what, um, I don't know why I'm getting that transition. Let me give it one more shot, the old college try, if you will. Okay, he says, we are old chums, and I'm proud of what the boy has done. Let him, let him blush. I tell you, for a Chinese boy to come to America when 12 years old, learn the language, pass through the Springfield Public Schools with honor, and then go through the preparatory course at Dr. Hopkins Grammar School in New Haven and be valedictorian of the class. I'm running out of breath. I bet he was too. Number one in English composition. Chinese boy, mind you and number one in English composition. 
number three in Greek and editor of the class paper a year and a half. He deserves that I should call him a Trump. And that was a good thing at the time. Couldn't resist, sorry. All right, so I wanna take us back to this image of these kids right at the beginning of their time in the Chinese educational mission in order to um, highlight uh, something about Americanization. So let me give you a comparison. So these are some of these kids a little bit later. I don't know if any of them were in the original pictures there. A nice trio of, of young men. You can see how easily they, they sort of inhabit the Western wear. I, I love that this uh, baseball team, which I think was in East Andover, the Orientals, I'm not sure. I, maybe they named themselves, I don't know. Uh, you can see just sort of lazing around. And, and I particularly love the image on the right because what says assimilation to American culture and especially maybe to American masculinity than posing with a rifle? So the CEM, uh, there, were, there were challenges inherent in the uh, Chinese educational mission. Young Wing himself sort of had an iffy relationship with it. He knew it was gonna go against traditional modes of Chinese instruction. Um, and, and lo and behold, for, for many of the kids, they did assimilate uh, to American culture. Um, one of course was Yan Fu Li who came back from after going home to China for a bit. This is what Young Wing has to say in his autobiography. In New England, the heavy weight of repression and suppression was lifted from the minds of these young students. They exulted in their freedom and leaped for joy. So the Chinese educational mission closes in 1881. Li is assigned to the Naval Academy at Tianjin. I'm just guessing, y'all. Uh, he leaves against the governor's wish, um, the government's wishes. Uh, he calls it taking French leave, which was a term for AWOL, kind of. Um, there's some evidence that suggests he was actually, you know, he needed to ask the government to be able to go to um, back to the U.S. But anyway, he does. Uh, move from there to work in an English law firm in Hong Kong and is able to return to the US in February of 1884. So to um, just get started on this question of um, developing a personal mission instead of following the Chinese educational mission, when Lee returns, he has converted to Christianity. This was a process that actually began when he was a student. He returns having cut off his uh, queue and donned Western attire and having moved away in those acts from Manchu fealty and having adopted a personal mission as a writer in America. So there are a couple of things I wanna to point to here. Uh, in this first piece, he, he says, and this is, um, I think from the Buffalo Weekly Express, yeah, in, in late August of 1884, just before he begins at Yale. I haven't fully outlined my future. I want, however, to finish my education. Frederick Douglass has done great good to his people, and it is my ambition to do all I can for China. Uh, this speaks volumes to me. Uh, the reference to Douglass and the idea that he would, in any sense, compare himself to Douglass speaks to how he's he is thinking what kind of analysis he's making about the plight of the, of the Chinese in, in the United States, what sort of work needs to be done, including brilliant writing and oratory. And I think I detect, you know, a little echo of uh, Frederick Douglass's brilliant eloquence in some of Lee's writing. I'm not saying that there's necessarily an influence. I haven't nailed that down, but this does uh, seem very important. And then in a piece published in the Harf uh, Hartford Current uh, a couple days later, uh, and this one is cited in Richard Lee's intro to his edition of When I Was a Boy in China, he says, I de desire to follow up a literary career. I think I can do a great deal of good in this country by simply correcting erroneous American ideas concerning Chinese affairs. It lays out uh, his, his general principle of 
always trying to give more information and to give corrective information if he can. After he has graduated from Yale, uh, just to show that this desire is consistent throughout his entire um, three years back at Yale, he's asked, what are your plans? And he says, I'm gonna go to postgraduate school at Yale. In fact, he did for a year. Um, and uh, he's going to study journalism in particular. He, and he says, I believe that I can do as much for the advancement of my countrymen in that way as any other. So we have a sense of what his personal mission was and that it was consistent. And so now I'd like to turn to the Yale years and Lee's development as a writer. And um, if I can find where the corners of the screen are, I can look at my notes again. Okay, so we know that he wrote for Wide Awake. What I didn't tell you is that he was on under contract for that from the D. Lothrop Corporation. Um, was a publisher in Boston. They hired him for that, but they also hired him to run a run a column or what they call the department for the Chautauqua Young Folks Journal. And it was a column called All, the Wound, All Around the World, All the World Round, sorry, in which he would take questions from readers and try to answer them. Often they would be questions about China, but sometimes about uh, other countries and children's lives elsewhere too. He also published a number of pieces with the, in the Yale Literary Magazine. And um, I've got three of them here for you. He actually published four stories in, um, I'm gonna blank on the dates, 1885, I believe. These three are sort of Asian uh, related. He also published a piece where he talked about spending the night in Concord in, uh, in um, the Wayside, which was Nathaniel Hawthorne's home. So he's working pretty hard. I think we can all agree on that. Um, he's writing in multiple venues and for many audiences and purposes. And as a teacher of writing, um, and even as a student of writing, you can, you can sense this too. We know that composing for different audiences, occasions, and in different genres is a powerful way to develop yourself as a writer. And so to my mind, what Lee is doing is precisely this. He's uh, developing himself as a writer. He's feeling out the possibilities in various rhetorical situations in order to step into arenas where sinophobia, either subtle or obvious, is a condition that um, is there and it conditions white readers' understandings of China and the Chinese. Okay, so among the things that I've discovered that, um, or uncovered, sorry, um, that, that Lee was doing while he was, oops, still a student at Yale, sorry, let me go back to the cover, um, is that he was uh, employed as an editor by Lothrop on Lothrop's edition, an 1885 edition of a British Orientalist, that's what they were called, uh, Robert Kennaway Douglas's book, China, the, the cover says History of China, but the title is China. Interestingly, uh, he is not credited by name in the book. In fact, it just merely says what? Let's see, I, I have to keep blowing these screens up. A Chinese scholar who combines a familiarity with the wisdom of his native land and acquaintance, acquaintance with the civilization and intelligence of America has read the text and has suggested uh, a few remarks by uh, which have been ta have taken the form of footnotes. Uh, probably the present the book at uh, the present book is the first work on China that has had the advantage of careful revision by a native of the flowery land educated in the civilization of both Eastern and Western hemispheres. Um, yeah, and I think that that's probably true. So, but Lee does something very interesting with this. Um, it's extraordinary, really. Uh, so he's writing footnotes. And if you get this book and you can find it online, um, you can see his footnotes. 
And a lot of the footnotes are, here's a translation of the word that Douglas didn't translate, or here's a little more information, or here's an update, things that have happened since the book was published. Um, but in many of his footnotes, well, a few, I don't know, a significant few, they loom large. Um, he actually takes issue with, with the text, right? So this is a two-page uh, footnote. Uh, it extends across two pages. And this is a section of the text that um, Douglas is talking about, um, a text by Con Confucius, and he has a problem with it in terms of like uh, whether it's fact uh, factual or not. So I'm going to highlight a few things. It's difficult for European to appreciate or understand the admiration that existed among the Chinese for this text. And uh, it's a, the text's apparent inaccuracies or willful, willful perversions of the truth are actually part of the author's plan, he explains, uh, within its culture. He goes on uh, to a Chinese he says the text that Douglas has provided is a travesty, not a translation, because it washes out and the delicate shades of meaning and the positions of words in the original have changed. And those are the things that are going to give, uh, you know, give the intent and content of the original. The author, he goes on further, only echoes the sentiments of Dr. Legg. Um, Dr. Legg is a, you know, a sort of predecessor of um, Douglas. Uh, to be an echo is not to be the original. It's to be a mere copy and an inferior one. And he says, basically, that the Chinese have commentaries on this text, and it explains it, and no Chinese is deceived by the text of Confucius. So this is a pretty amazing thing to me. Um, here we see you know, this student at Yale calling out the author of the text, standing toe to toe with him, expert versus expert, implying strongly that Western Orientalism is, is an, offers an incomplete account of Chinese religion, culture, and art. And at best, it's incomplete. Um, at worst, it's totally misleading. Let me move on then. One other thing that Lee published during this time of his life is a pretty amazing thing as well. Lee's graphic chart of English literature, you might notice he signs it YP Lee, so he doesn't disclose his um, nationality as a cagey move. This is a chart, um, trying to get the slide to advance of uh, 60 by 98 centimeters, if you're on the metric system. Uh, and it renders the history of uh, English prose writing and poetry writing as a, as a mountain range and where the uh, peaks are assumed to be greater, you know. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a higher resolution scan of this. I took photos of this uh, in the Yale library and didn't get good shots. Um, but these are all, there are all these names in there and um, the dates of birth and death. And then for poets uh, on, across the bottom range, there are fewer poets. Um, so if you're wondering who that tall peak is, that's uh, Shakespeare. So whether, you know, Lee was probably um, encoding uh, received wisdom on um, English prose or English writers, at the time, maybe from courses he had, maybe from books his professor wrote. Uh, but the reason I think this is important is this, he doesn't have to do this as completely extracurricular. This chart turns out to be kind of a teaching chart and it was vetted by, he showed it to English professors at Yale, Brown and Harvard, who all said, you know, this is pretty good and it's practical. So you could put it on the wall of a classroom. But I think it's more of an autodidactic thing. He's teaching himself. I mean, those of us who are teachers understand that one way you can really know about a subject is to teach it and to prepare the materials for teaching is a way in which you're really learning and solidifying knowledge. And I think that that's what um, Lee is doing. Okay, one other thing, and I'll try to breeze through this part uh, that 
when people write, the, the few scholars and critics who write about Yan Fu Li, and it's very few, and I don't think anybody is doing it right now, aside from me, um, one thing that they don't account for is necessarily, or necessarily is Li's lecturing. Uh, lecturing um, in the 19th century, um, public lecturing was a vital form of publication and dissemination of ideas is a tradition that went back to before the Civil War. It was called the Lyceum tradition. And uh, into the late 19th century, it took on new energy with the Chautauqua movement. Um, as one scholar notes, uh, I believe this is, um, the last name is Ray, R-A-Y. I'm sorry, I don't have the first name. The Lyceum was designed for 19th century um, audience members to embrace learning, to grow in knowledge outside their ordinary sphere, to transcend parochial or provincial tendencies, and to become worldly, that is fully functioning members of a social economy, literate in the knowledges and morals of that culture. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's a little bit like 19th century, uh, the 19th century version of TED Talks, and you'll see why in just a minute. Uh, and therefore it does risk a little bit of the infotainment charge. Uh, these are a couple announcements of lectures by Lee from 84 and 85. Um, the one thing I wanted to call attention to here is that he was doing this to uh, impart, you know, to get the word out, but also to make a little money to help pay his expenses at Yale. He put himself through with the ex exception of a couple um, scholarships, um, and later in life, he says he got through Yale by move, uh, exercising his jaws, is how he puts it. Also, you might notice in that top one, the word stereopticon comes up, and that's what makes me think of TED Talks. Lee often lectured with the stereopticon, which was um, a uh, projection device where two images could be projected such that one dissolves over the other behind you as you're, as you're talking, much like... Um, you know, uh, a TED talk in some way. Lectures could be extracted uh, in the newspapers and then sent um, around the country very rapidly through the newspaper exchange system and networks. So for instance, um, a talk that Lee gave in Lowell, Massachusetts in April 80, 1885 was printed, the, uh, an extract from it or a description of it was printed the next day, a thousand miles away in Baldwin, Kansas. This is not uncommon. Uh, at all. Lee apparently put on quite a show in addition to um, English fluency and erudition and humor that were always remarked on. He often also wore Chinese um, attire, Chinese costumes. In one of his lectures, he wore a, um, a skull cap that had a fake cue attached, and at some point he pulls it off, maybe to the audience's delight. I think pulling it off is a, a way of sort of, you know, indicating his uh, multicultural identity, but also saying, I'm you and I'm, and I'm not you in some way. Okay, for time's sake, I'm gonna skip through a couple examples I had for you, but I can share these slides and you might want to look at these examples yourself. Here's an example of that kind of before and after I just implied with the um, wearing Chinese uh, attire, but being this Western educated man. This is from that same 1894 uh, newspaper article uh, that I cited in the title. Uh, that the um, caption of the one on the left, Lee while he was a student at Yale, the one on the right, Lee before he was a student at Yale. I see that Chad is lighting up a little bit maybe. Uh, so if you all can see if there are questions, um, I'd be happy to try to answer this. Okay, it's around nine o'clock. I'm gonna to try to speed it up a little bit. So going back to when I was a boy in China, one of the things we see is that chapter five begins with this, this chapter. I mean, sorry, this paragraph. I still I continually find false ideas in America concerning Chinese customs, manners, and institutions. Small blame to the people at large who have no means of learning the truth except for newspapers or accounts of travelers who do not understand what they see in passing through our country. Interesting that he says, uh, small blame to people at large, but to scholars like Douglas, I think there is some blame. 
From the time, I'm continuing, sorry, from the time of Sir John Mandeville, who wrote bogus travelogues, right? Travelers with a few noble exceptions have vied with each other in relating the most wonderful stories about our ancient empire. Accordingly, what I tell in the series of articles about Chinese customs, manners, and institutions may often contradict general belief. And in fact, that's kind of the plan. I would like you to focus or keep in mind that word wonderful, right? They tell these wonderful tales, right? Most wonderful stories. That's going to come back. So uh, Lee's book is in uh, sort of dialogue or dialectical relationship, if you will, with um, other children's books, other, other things children could consume about China, including this, this book, uh, Fun from the flower, flowery, sorry, flowery Land, Three Wonderful Tales. There's that sense of, of wonder, right? Um, I, I think somebody raised a hand. I don't wanna, just make sure you get to me at the end, for sure. Um, here's an illustration from that same book where you see two, um, perhaps these are supposed to be um, mandarins with cues that are preternatural. They're like animals themselves. What are they doing? They're at a market and they're buying rats. So that's the kind of thing that Lee's more anthropological writing was competing with. In addition, I'll just throw in Louisa May Alcott's Eight Cousins, which features a, a pretty um, stereotypical version of a young Chinese boy put into play with a sort of prim and proper white girl. I had the idea that we could go on the web and take a look at an online version of Wide Awake and make some comparisons, but I'm gonna cut that um, for now and uh, just keep moving forward so we have some time for Q&A. Uh, for life after Yale, so, you know, commencement is the sort of when you're commencing a new life. And, uh, and Lee delivers a, a powerful commencement address when he graduates in 1887, in uh, the end of June 1887. Here we see uh, from the, uh, the Yale Daily News, a kind of itinerary. And there are about eight orations. And you can see down here that Lee, uh, Lee is in the position right before the valedictorian. You know, that can make you very nervous, I would think. Um, nonetheless, here's what uh, this report says. The orations were all good, uh, but that of Mr. Lee was probably the most popular. He was applauded throughout and his witty remarks were frequently the cause of much laughter among the audience. That's one, uh, one rendition of this. Here's a little more uh, detailed report from the New Haven uh, Morning Journal and Courier. And uh, in which um, it said that uh, if you look at the top of that, um, Lee's oration carried off the highest honors of the occasion. He showed marked ability, and his oration was everywhere the subject of special commendation among the Yale men who heard it. As said Chauncey Depew, an important politician in the day, in his witty speech at the alumni dinner, referring to Lee, the Chinese must go. That is, if we were to have this kind of competition, so I think he meant that as humorous. Um, Lee made telling hits against the exclusive policy which prohibited Chinese immigration and con contended that such a policy should have no footing in free cosmopolitan and liberal America. And it goes on from there. Just to show you a little bit of this, um, I can send out a link later. I created a PDF that has a link to this file if you want to uh, take a look at it yourself. Um, I would like to just focus, if I can move this Zoom window out of my way, on this part right here where it says, sorry, even if Americans are disposed to forget. So even if Americans are disposed to forget about what they've done, uh, exclusion, Sinophobia, et cetera, the Chinese will not fail to keep the sad record of faith unkept, of persecution permitted by an enlightened people, of rights violated without redress in a land where all are equal before the law. 
I love the balanced phrasing there, the parallel structures, faith unkept, persecution permitted, rights violated. To me, it's reminiscent of Douglas and just really good oration. So uh, just quickly, three refutations he's interested in in this um, oration before the audience of uh, graduates and their family. Labor needed in the US and funds to pay for it, he says, are not necessarily fixed on. So the idea that there's always going to be a competition for just a little is perhaps a little, uh, is papering over some bigger problems, some structural problems. The Chinese government is not trying to dump its redundant population on the US. We've heard that rhetoric before. It's, it's still here, right? And fears of the Mongolization of America are patently absurd and not reality-based. Okay, so I see I'm running low on time. I'm gonna put that link in so you can take a look at um, Lee's The Chinese Must Stay on your own. I would especially commend you to look at the first two paragraphs and uh, just let the um, eloquence wash over you. It's pretty impressive. Now, um, just some non-literary things. I can't cover any of this. <laughs> These are just, uh, you know, Lee led, as Amy Ling said, a highly peripatetic life. He was moving around, in other words, all the time. Twice married, both times to white women, uh, connected to missionary organizations, did editing work, lectured throughout his life. Uh, there is one thing I'll, I'll single out, upper right-hand corner. He was involved in an attempt to open a boarding school for Chinese youth in America from, from China, from America and from China, which was interesting. Um, the Oriental Academy in Kelly's Cove, uh, North Carolina, found a little bit on this, but not much. Ran a poultry business, et cetera. The last job he did in America full-time uh, before he uh, left America in 1927, was he was the managing editor of the American Banker. So just in closing, I've taken this right out of Richard Lee's book, right out of the introduction. And uh, he's giving us uh, abstract, uh, extract of an interview uh, with immigration services uh, in which Lee is asked, of what country are you now a citizen or subject? Lee answers, it's hard to say. In 1887 and 1888, I took, took out my first papers to become a citizen of this country, but I never got my last papers on account of the amendment to the exclusion law preventing me. He did in fact um, attempt to get citizenship even before 87. And uh, later in life, uh, the, when he was a farmer in Delaware, the Delaware State Grange, petitioned uh, that there be a special exception in law. And that actually went to the House of Representatives where I think it never came out of committee. So then the next question, then you must be a citizen of China. Is that right? He says, I presume so, so or a citizen of no country at all. There are a number of ways of taking this. I mean, we could be left on a very sad note with that. And it's a pretty, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty sad. Here's what Richard Lee says. Yan Fu Lee's observation that he might be a citizen of no country at all made him a citizen of the world. So we can think of him as transnational. We can think of him as a global citizen. And he's caught up in systems that have to do with nationality, culture, race, and all of that. Amy Ling uh, pointed this out. The quotes are hers that Lee explored and lived on a cross-cultural cross -cultural frontier, a psychological and emotional state that found external expression in his life choices and in his writing, manifesting the fluctuating double consciousness of all racial minorities. Um, and Ling is referring there to W.E.B. Du Bois's work, um, The Souls of Black Folk and the concept of double consciousness. So, so that we can have some time to talk, um, I'm going to close it here and just uh, 
I think I'm going to close it. Yeah. Just say thank you very much for your time and your attention to my rambles. I know I left a lot out. Maybe I can fill in some gaps. So that's it. That's all, folks. Okay, Mike, that was a great, great, great uh, webinar. As you said, the chats have laid up and there are some uh, questions in the Q&A. Okay. So uh, what I can do is uh, I can, you know, uh, relay some of the question to you. So Sounds to save your time to go through the, go through the, the chat. Yeah. And okay. so, yeah, so my, may we do that? And I think there will be more people, you know, keep asking questions. Uh, you know, keep asking questions as they go. And then you also got the invitation from our friends, Wilson Lee, I'll mention on that. Yeah, anyway, so, uh, so Mike, uh, here's some of the questions and, uh, you know, feel free if you want to get Matt, Ben, or even Susan involved in yeah. some of these uh, uh, interactions. So, so th there was a question about say, you know, who are Lee's Royal Raiders? You know, did he introducing oh. lots of Chinese customers or culture? And are there businessmen who were interested in doing business with China? You know, so like, uh, so he's, uh, you know, is he helping that aspect and this and that? I think uh, I remember one of your slides actually covered that, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a terrific question. Um, okay. As far as loyal readers, it's hard to say um, because after, after 1887, when he graduates for, uh, from Yale and after 1889 with the publication yeah. of The Chinese Must Stay, um, he, he doesn't really do a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. Now, he was, he was uh, sort of at a startup. He had a, I, I use the word startup. It's not a 19th century word. Yeah. Uh, he tried, uh, he did, in fact, he was uh, part of a group that created the Chinese Evangelists. Mm -hmm. The Chinese Evangelist was a paper that uh, was uh, part on one side Chinese, on the other side English. It was there to help people learn English and also for a sort of Christianized Chinese audience. And so that would have built up a kind of readership, but that was a short lived publication. It only lasted um, like two years. And it's very, the, the copies that exist in archives, as far as I can tell, are very sparse. And um, so that kind of work would have developed an audience for Lee. Um, but other than I would say that there was a sort of ongoing lecture audience, which were white middle-class Americans, and he lectured all over the Northeast and all over the South. It's really amazing. In backwater towns here in South Carolina, he, he lectured. So he was constantly out there. Um, but I don't think he ever had a kind of stable audience. Yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, a, it's hard to know, right? So that's in the history, but at the same time, you know, where he publishes and things like that, that maybe gave us something. And okay, so there's- Oh, can I add question. one thing? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so please. It just, had, it just occurred to me. Uh, in terms of business, yeah. when he was a farmer in Delaware, he was growing Chinese specialty vegetables and fruits and shipping oh. them into, um, into New York City. So there was, you know, that kind of commerce going on. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, he, was, uh, he was an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you also, there was one slide you didn't go in there, but you had a lot of his uh, other activities, you know, besides a writer and this, yeah. So, okay, so let's see. So there's another question. Uh, this one is about, it's interesting that, uh, you know, Yang Fo Li, he was saying very similar things, uh, you know, as uh, some Chinese people are saying now about the misrepresentation of China, all Chinese culture by, you know, uh, the, the newspapers. And do you find any parallels between then and now? <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, there, you, you can't open the book without finding parallels. Um, there's something about the perniciousness of ideology and the culture that grows out of it. And, and the same can be said about um, other groups of people as well. So, um, you know, I think the thing about Lee is he, he had this basic 
faith in a kind of liberal democratic subjectivity where he thought, if I give you the information, yeah. you know, you can learn. And he doesn't necessarily do a critique of ideology and culture. Uh, you know, I think we can see plenty of examples right now without even my mentioning them of, you know, you can endlessly give people information, but if the ideology is strong, it, it will repel it at every turn. So I do see parallels. Um, yes. And uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, the connection to Frederick uh, Douglass. So yes. there was a question that was there any hint that Lee ever communicated with uh, Fred, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass? It's so it's so hard to know. Uh, in fact, I am um, right here. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, I got uh, David Blight's book on Frederick Douglass, which is a monumental tome. And I looked through it to see, because he does like day by day in the life of Frederick Douglass. Was he ever in, you know, Springfield, New Haven? Would, you know, Yan Fu Lee maybe mm -hmm. have seen him? Or, you know, it's, there's just not correspondence from Lee. Uh, you can read uh, Richard Lee's introduction to his edition of when I was a boy in China to, to know what happened with a lot of the, um, effects of Lee and his family. So there's well, just- I think of the, yeah, so you, 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 I mean, you point out the, you know, Lee's writing, you know, very much have the Fred Douglas flavor, right? In some of the writings there, yeah. Right. Part of that is because Frederick Douglass was a master orator mm -hmm. and he trained himself to read and write through reading orations and Lee was reading orations too. So part of it is a common source that they're both just um, masterful uh, rhetors, if you will, in the um, in the Western tradition. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So yeah, there is uh, questions about uh, you know any background or feedback about his family in China. I guess this was uh, would be talking about his family then in China. Oh. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a lot of knowledge of that. Perhaps Matt or um, or Ben, if if he's still here, or oh, or Susan, Susan, yeah, can chime might, in. Might have some knowledge of that, and that's you know, as a as a literary scholar, my focus tends to be laser focused on a particular period, and you got to screen out a lot, even though I'm totally fascinated by all details. Well, uh, this is Ben Lee speaking. Uh, I'm, I'm the great grandson of uh, Lee Ang Fu and the brother of uh, Matt, who's also on the call. Um, we have so far uh, really not been able to find any firm documentary records uh, of, uh, of, of his family here in China. Um, back in uh, 1990, I believe, um, my dad, uh, the late Richard Lee, and I uh, did spend some time <clears throat> in Guangdong looking in the public archives and things there uh, to see what we could find. Um, but uh, as it was an area that was very much damaged and, and many public buildings and, and public documents were destroyed during the, the Japanese um, occupation, more, um, we were unable to find anything. Since then, uh, I've had the, um, the opportunity to go back <clears throat> to, um, uh, to, to uh, Macau and, and um, Zhongshan uh, Xian, uh, where he grew up, um, to look some more and haven't really, still haven't really found anything. Um, fortunately, there's a very strong, um, you know, renewed interest in the Chinese educational mission as a whole and in uh, Liang Fu and other eminent members of that group, Zhan Tianyo and uh, Tang Shaoyi and, and others. And so maybe uh, somebody who, who is interested will, will really dig into the gazetteers and other information and find something. But uh, the, the short answer is that up until now, we really haven't been able to find anything. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Mike, there's a lot of interest about uh, having uh, the you know the present the PDF of your presentation. Oh, sure. yeah. 
And uh, so I guess we'll, we'll, we will make uh, the webinar recording available, uh, but we will also, I guess, later on get uh, possibly a link uh, to the PDF file. And if you're willing to share with people, there's a really quite a number of uh, ask for that. And then I think, uh, let's see. So there's another specific question was, uh, did he stay in the US until the end of his life? And uh, did he also have friends, contemporary friends of that time worth mentioning or, you know, or he been mentioning? So we know how his interaction with the, you know, his peers at the time, yeah. Um, <laughs> he did not live out his life. Um, in fact, that's a part I cut off and, and, and Ben or, or Matt could speak to this too, but um, he's, he's thought to, he, he went back to China in 1927 that, Q and A was from his exit interview, and he stayed in China. He had made some trips back and forth between China and the U.S. in connection with um, ex exhibition business that he was doing, mm -hmm. but um, he stayed. And he probably died in an air raid, uh, bomb, Japanese bombing of Canton. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other question about um, whether he was acquainted with other other people. I haven't seen that in the seems like a million newspaper articles I've read. Um, a Chinese ambassador came in the late 19th century to the US and he, you know, of course he went and saw him. He probably had some associations. He was a political operative in Woodbury, New Jersey at some point where he, he was a campaign manager for somebody. So I think most of the figures are kind of local and related to him in that way. Matt, were you gonna add uh, to that? I saw you popped in. I was just gonna say that by the time he left in 1927, his first son, his son, first son by his first marriage had already died. Yes. Um, had been been killed uh, in World War One. He was a pilot, um, Gilbert yeah. Jerome. Uh, and, and he obviously he was estranged from both his first and or divorced from his first wife and estranged uh, from yeah. from his second, um, <clears throat> and and so that you know all of that had happened. That it was a pretty tumultuous period in in, in his life. That was yeah. that, that was the only thing I was going to add. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, there was a question about that because with the Chinese Exclusion Act and the other anti miscegenation laws. You know, there was something about American women married to non-U.S. citizens would lose their citizenship. So the question was, did they, this happen to Lee's, you know, like, uh, you know, to the two wives, you know? Well, if you, um, I would recommend that you guys read the introduction to Richard Lee's edition mm -hmm. of When I Was a Boy in China, because he explains that many of the effects, uh, many of the things that might have survived in the family were destroyed because of anti anti miscegenation laws, what they call mm -hmm. you know sort yep. of anti marriage laws. Those tended to be state, state by state. California had one of the worst up into the 1940s that a white woman or white person could not marry um, a person of Asian extraction or Mexican or you know or I don't know if African American was in there. So you know our country has this sort of um, uh, patchwork quilt of anti-miscegenation legislation that's state. Um, I don't know if there was ever a national law though. I, I kind of think not. I think uh, state by state though, there's some pretty amazing stuff that was on the books for a long, long time. And they were worried about uh, the discovery of Asian ancestry. Um, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt or Ben, but I believe Clarence had to go to Arizona to get married. That's he correct. Was, he um, had to leave San Diego. He was a, he, San Diego. Clarence Lee. Uh, Clarence Vale Lee went to uh, Annapolis. Uh, yeah. Was a sailor. Was then based in San Diego, and he wanted to get married in California because of the law. You mentioned that. Yeah, he and his fiance had to go to Yuma, I believe, in Arizona to to get married. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so let's see, there's a, uh, there's a uh, Jing Dai from Aldings has a question, raise the hand. Can you, do you want to ask your, ask the question, uh, you know, uh, do you want to ask a question? You are, you can 
uh, ask the question directly if you are able to speak. Jean, this is Jean Dai. Okay, so it looks like, uh, okay, so she lowered her hands. So here, so Wilson, so, so, so Professor <laughs> Duvall, so we have our friend Wilson here and he's a founder of Chinese American Heritage Foundation uh -huh. and Wilson Lee, no less. And he's also, you know, obviously with the Lee Family Association of the United States. So he has an open invitation to you. So he's now can, he can ask the question. He can say, you know, he can issue his invitation to you directly. Wilson, you are on. <laughs> oh, hello, Professor. How are you? Good. How are you, Wilson? Thanks Thank for you coming. so much. I, I learned so much today from your uh, talk. Uh, let me see if I can. Um, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes I we hear you very okay. well. Uh, I don't know if you can. I don't know how. I'm not really good at this. I'm, well, anyway, you can see the logo. So, yeah, we really enjoyed it so much. I mean, this is really incredible. I think we need to learn more about the other members of the uh, education mission. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. we'd we'll love to talk to you offline and invite you to uh, Chicago. We'll probably work with the uh, Chicago Museum, Chinese Museum in Chicago, and maybe host you sometime in 2022. Well, well that would be terrific. Um, uh, are you based in New York or where are you based? I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. But, oh, wonderful. Um, wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. Um, my, I, I hope my, I don't know if my email address is on the, um, I'm going to put it in chat. So yeah. it's okay. My, well, we can make the connection with Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very yeah, much. So, yeah. So, and uh, Wilson Lee. So now there's, uh, so Wilson, you now you see Matt Lee, Ben Lee, Susan Lee. So, so oh, we, Lee. we have the whole family. That's, That's incredible. Right, family, That's incredible. We're so proud of uh, Mr. Lee, Uncle Lee, you know, I mean, wow. He's, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, but I think by the look of it, I think they should call you Uncle Lee. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, no, I should, no, Lee brothers and sisters. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Wilson. Great. Thank you. So, Jing, are you? I saw you unmuted yourself. Well, again, can you? Do you want to ask a question now? Yes, you can talk if you are able. So there's also, so, okay, so let me relay another information. Uh, so to Mike, so there was uh, this Mingzo. So he mentioned that he's a reporter and documentary filmmaker in mm -hmm. San Francisco Bay Area. And what he have known for Yang Fu Li was a warrior defending, you know, the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. And he seemed have suffered a lot while being a journalist and orator, uh, you know, such as uh, poverty and attacks. And uh, so that was ended in a question mark. I guess so that was part of the info. Maybe there's some, he's also asking some of the information there. Yeah. Mm. Is that in the chat? Yeah, it, this is in the Q and A. Yeah. Oh, in Q and A. Yeah. And also, there was audience mentioned that uh, you know there was mentioned another. So, uh, Professor Emma Ten at MIT also did uh, quite a bit work. Oh, okay. In similar will... area, so that was uh, for reference. Yeah. I will uh, definitely look like. Is is the um, the Q and A cannot be saved? for later. <laughs> I mean, just so I have the, the who asked what and what the questions were and information like Emma, uh, Professor Emma Tang. Yeah, we'll try to, we'll see what we can do. Maybe okay. we can do screenshots. Yeah. Great. Great. We can do screenshots. And uh, then there was also, you know, you mentioned the, the beginning, you mentioned, the, you know, using uh, you know, Lee's own word, eventful and uh, somewhat romantic. So yeah. there was a question about the, uh, you know, and now what it, can you comment on the romantic aspect? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I think he means romantic um, yeah. in the sense of, you know, sort of the tradition of romance in, in English literature, you mm -hmm. know, so go back to King Arthur and that kind of thing. So like high adventures and that kind of thing. I don't think he means romantic there 
as um, you know, romance between two two people, mm -hmm. um, unless he's using it totally ironically, and he might be. He just had gone through a pretty messy divorce uh, with um, you know with his first wife. There were accusations that he uh, was unfaithful to her, and he couldn't disprove them. He finally let it go with no contest. It was kind of an ugly situation in the New Haven press. And so I think when he says somewhat romantic, um, if, if he's talking about romance in the, in the sense of love between people, it's ironic and um, sarcastic. But I think he means romantic in terms of like, you know, he represents himself as having escaped from China. You know, that's a kind of romance thing. You escape from captivity and then you bring yourself, pull yourself up and, you know, that kind of romance. And there's a lot of triumph in his life. So perhaps that's in there too. It can have many significations. Yes. So I think, uh, Susan, I saw you, you know, showed up. That's great. So Susan, can you say add some of your comments, please? <laughs> Only that I thank all of you and especially Professor Duvall for do, doing so much uh, wonderful research. Um, it's uh, something that's come up <clears throat> more recently. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the Yale Alumni Magazine did a cover story on Yan Fu Li. Uh, in May, June, the May, June issue, I think. <clears throat> so that was exciting. And um, then there were letters to the editor that came out in the, in the recent issue. Oh. So I think- I'll have you, to look at those. Yeah, you can get it online, I think, unless you- Oh, I, you know, um, I, I have the article, Mark Branch's article. And in fact, I was just trying to figure out how to put it, put a link to um, a file with a link to, oh, I guess I can't share it out. Uh, but yeah, Mark Branch's article from two issues back of the Yale alumni, but I haven't seen the new, I haven't seen the new one and looked at the letters to the editor, so. Yeah, well, it just came out in paper, I mean, in print, a week or so ago. This is oh wow cover of it. But inside, the letters to the editor are interesting. And <clears throat> well, thank you so much. Yeah, we also saw, you know, we also saw there was a Yale alumni article that uh, Lee is on the cover. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right. That, that was this one. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. 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 But anyway, it's it's really exciting to see all the attention being paid to this. And now with Ben living and working in Shanghai and Matthew and as a <laughs> journalist <laughs> reporter at the State Department, it it, um, it keeps me my ears perked up <laughs> hugely. <laughs> keep track of Ben's relationships and um, hmm. Matthew's, you know, trips with the Secretary of State, which I hope will improve current relations. Um, we'll have to see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, we can continue this discussion and there's a still a lot of uh, message in the chat, but I think it's a, probably in the interest time and we would like to conclude this webinar. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, when I say we have an all-star lineup and I, I do really mean it. And also here, I do want to, again, acknowledge Cassie and Juan. She's really the linchpin that is making all this happening and uh, reach out to everybody. And I think uh, there's organization she's representing it. And mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the Chinese name for that is Mei Hua Si Ji. 
，所以今天的活动是 n 奈卡跟美华史记合办的，所以我今天就非常感谢黄倩。然后 ，at the same time， it's a great great pleasure to you know not only you know to listen to the wonderful seminar from Mike. A true scholar, you know. I in my field, I just hear. I know this is a. You must be a wonderful teacher, scholar, and everything, because that's just it. Just came through, you know, so clearly. And I think it's a great, great pleasure here to have a Susan, Matt, and Ben, and really, really, you know, make this very, very special. Yeah. And then so all the generations coming together. There was actually a question earlier, so I missed the beginning. The person was asking, "Was the speaker the?" Great, you know, grandchild of、uh, Yang Feng Li, and then now, you know, only well, academically. That's right, academically. That's true. So I'm like a cousin, I think. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in for another、mm -hmm. edition, and thank you all the our distinguished the panelists and guests. And、uh, so, well, good night, and、uh, we'll stay connected. So Mike will get the, some of the info about the you know people who are asking. You know, we will make the recording available. And、okay. if you will, we can share.、Uh, you know, if you have a PDF link or file, and we can share the presentation material. We can get、well. that together.、Yeah. Thank you so and much. And there's actually a great、yeah. question and、uh, a message from the audience. They said, "Mike, when your book is published, we will do everything to promote it." <laughs> I, I have to say, y'all, I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm not writing a book right now. I'm writing an academic article. <laughs> okay. That is focused on. All of the intricacies of publishing in a children's magazine,、uh, a well, book. Maybe I think it's probably waste the background now. It's probably worth reading. A lot of people probably will be interested in reading it. I would. So, so we'll we'll, we'll share it as a follow up. Too much.、Uh, so yeah. So we'll save all the chat history. So people who post their emails there will adding you to your mailing list. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you all for the wonderful questions in chat. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them. There's some really good questions in there, so I'll get the transcript, and if I can, I'll try to answer them, and、um, we'll we'll get it back out hopefully through NECA. Okay.、But、thank you、okay. all so much, and for the very、uh, very high praise, I, I am humbled. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, and good night. Good night. Good night. <clears throat>、I、felt like I was racing through that, y'all. No, you, 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 man, your, your pace was wonderful. Yeah, and so I mean, I, I think it's a,、uh, you know, I mean, I didn't even notice the time. You know, like when you say it's already nine, I said. Oh nine! I thought it's only half hour past because、uh, there's so, so so a lot of interesting stuff really holding、there's, people's interest. I left interest out.、Here. I、yeah. left out a lot.、Um, yeah. To,、um, but you know. <laughs> Mike, when can we expect your article? Uh, <laughs> One、I'm、year. So I have to say, and may, and maybe um, um, you know, yeah, as an academic. I, I'm a, I'm a painfully slow writer. Well, that's、uh, good. That's a fantastic. Slow reader. No, I am.、Um, I'm way too self-critical in the writing. So you know, maybe Matt has some tricks for me. So what happens if <laughs> rather than、uh, you know, I'm like fussing over this phrase. No, I need to get a like. But what about the big picture? It's going to take me, you know, years and years to write. I've been working hard on the draft of it. Uh, and sort of trying to give up a little bit of,、uh, you know, the perfectionism. Thank、it. you so much for letting us、uh, rediscover Mr. Yan Feng Li. This is great legacy. And is is a great way to disseminate information. And you know, it's not it's not going to give me you know credit toward a promotion, <laughs> <laughs> but it's more important. So that's just the irony of the academy for you.、Yeah. Uh, this kind of work is is more important. So, and I appreciate.、Um, yeah, that's.、Uh, Somebody has a question. Yeah, I see that there's a hand. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So we we are lost. Xiong Bing. He's the, 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 the he's、young. the principal of a school here. So yes, Xiong Bing. Summer school. Hi. Oh, hi, hi everyone. Hello,、uh, Doctor Duol. Thank you so much for for the, for the presentation. I guess I, I, you know what, I stay on. I want you know, wish I have a, like a opportunity to talk to you.、Uh, we're so thankful, you know, for you to、uh, to come on, you know, to 
to you know to present this you know this uh, 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 a webinar. Uh, at this time, at this time, I think after you know the, the last year and a half, you know what uh, Chinese Americans have gone through, we are uh, at a very confusing crossroad right now. We don't, you know, we, we feel like we belong, but somehow, uh, you know, we are singled out again. You know, like it, our uh, advancing, you know, you know, like uh, uh, you, you know, uh, racial equality in this country just all of a sudden turn back the clock. I almost feel like a hundred years back. Uh, but, you know, when you told the story, you know, that, you know, with Mr. Lee at that time was such a fantastic, you know, like a citizen, you know, show a lot of uh, um, talent, you know, seems like he's bridging the culture at that time, you know, in his era. Yeah. But uh, the funny thing is, you know, we we don't feel the progress we're making, you know, Chinese Americans have been working very hard in this country, you know, we, we you know, we, we uh, are contributing in many, so many different ways. Um, what do you think, you know, like, I mean, this is a big question, you know, I mean, you don't have a good answer, I'm not going to blame you, you know, <laughs> how, you know, how the Chinese Americans deal with what we are facing right now, you know, like, a, to move on, it seems like we're stuck, we're, we're running in a circle, chasing our own tails. Yeah, I don't think that's a question I can answer, but I, but I, I think I understand what you're saying. I mean, I, I do think um, just ideology and, and the formations of culture that grow off of it, it it's just so powerful. It, it's really disheartening to see, you know, especially the last um, four years where things just became obviously so xenophobic and sinophobic and, you know, um, just sort of uh, anti-immigrant and, and everything else. I, and I don't have, I'm sorry that I don't have an answer. Oh, I don't I'm blame kidding. you. I don't blame you. But you know what? We have to say we're very thankful for what you, you know, we're teaching in a college. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, maybe you can shed some light, you know, when you teach, you know, uh, Mr. Lee, you know, uh, uh, um, together with all the other writers, what do you call the marginalized writers? Right. What did what how your students respond? Like what what you know like a, what do you see obviously they taken away from you from your from your lecture? Well, because I insist on the historical framing, I think that they're pretty amazed about Chinese American history with Chinese exclusion and all the other laws that came before it. There were all of these laws that were sort of, you know, they'd be about um occupancy in a wooden building in San Francisco, but they were only being enforced on Chinese people. You know, so they're pretty blown away that there's a history that, that they haven't been taught uh, of immigration in the United States, you know, because the one that we're more, the one I'm familiar with from growing up, and I'm now 57 years old, but you know, it was always about the Eastern European immigrants and that, but I'd never heard about Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act or understood like the importance of Supreme Court cases. Uh, there's one um, Yo, Yo Wick case and several others that established the 14th Amendment yes. protections. So I think that they're genuinely like blown away by that history. And then they get to read that, read literature in relation to it and then put writers into comparison. I mean, one of the things you'll see in Lee, he's not a saint. You know, but one of the things you'll see is a reflection of the caste system in the US where in the Chinese must go, he will take shots at Irish immigrants. <laughs> He'll say that they're lazy. And that in part, that's because the caste system in the United States demands that there be this high sense of hierarchy. And the way you establish yourself is I'm not black, you know, or I'm not <laughs> Irish, you know. And so um, it's, it's a tricky situation, but I think students enjoy the complexity of all of these issues and it's news to them. We appreciate it. I, I just chip in a little bit uh, on that because my grandfather, Lee Young, yeah, yeah. son, Louis Lee, Lewis. father's father, yeah. uh, who, you know, went to great pains to hide 
his Chinese uh, background and lineage and the, the story that's told in the Yale alumni article, as well as that my brother and father have told publicly a lot of times, you know, my, my dad did not know yeah. that he had Chinese ancestry until the night before he married my mother. <laughs> and wow. uh, he was wow. and, and, and told that this might be something that would make my mother's parents reconsider uh, the marriage, <laughs> which it right. did. But at the same time, Lewis Lee, uh, my grandfather, who was a wonderful grandfather, was <laughs> he was very racist. Uh, a lot of that, I think, came from this uh, desire that you mentioned uh, is to uh, separate him, himself and push other people down. I mean, mm -hmm. he had a very successful building contracting company in New Canaan. He had worked with a major, major construction firm that built a lot of the the the, the gilded, you know, the golden age manors out on Long Island on the Gold yeah. Coast, mm -hmm. and then started his own company and was quite concerned that, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if word, if, if it turned, if people became, if it became known that Louis E. Lee was Chinese and he did not look, uh, you could tell, if you, if you knew, you could tell, but if you didn't, yeah. I think he was just a little peculiar looking for a Caucasian. Uh, but if it got out that he would lose business and that his family yeah. would suffer. Um, at, at, this dynamic but, happens in um, other <laughs> racial categories too. Yeah, so it wasn't really in my family, it wasn't until my father um, took a you know, huge interest in this and in Ruth that it, that, it became, uh, that it became known. And that wasn't until the, late, that, you know, the mid to late 70s and, uh, and early 80s. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's an American <laughs> story. What a story. Yeah. And then, so that's, uh, you know, Mike, you mentioned about the students are really in check and they're fascinating. So one of the things that we are pushing, NICA is also pushing, and to pass laws, you know, so to, you know, to have basic API history and culture in the K-12 education. Right. And so there's a, you know, education fails here in Massachusetts and we're pushing. And of course, uh, you know, New York and other places and the yes. Illinois, of course, already passed that a law. So, yeah, that's what um, uh, Kathy had said that in an email earlier yeah. today. I knew and I'd heard of that because I have uh, friends who live in Illinois um, who had mentioned it. Um, but, you know, at the same time, and that's absolutely essential work that's being done. But at the same time, you have this, uh, you know, fear of critical race theory. Yes. Is this <laughs> meaningless term that um, has been applied in this very ideological way from, from the right to suggest that, you know, if I'm, if, say I'm teaching this class that I'm teaching white students in there to feel guilty. I don't, you know, I don't think they feel guilty and nobody wants anybody to feel guilt, but we want you to sort of recognize, but that's what this is, the system we're in now comes out of those other systems. So now there's responsibility. And, you know, uh, if you're not taught it, you can't know it. Yeah, absolutely. Other, yeah. On the other yeah. hand, um, you know, then there are lots of people who don't want you to know it. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Duval, what do you think about the CRT, critical race theory? Um, I've, you know, I've never like used the term myself for the work I do, but I do work that comes out of critical race theory. There's a oh, central, okay, I see. You know, a central concept that's associated with um, Kimberly Crenshaw who is one of the figures who is mentioned as, you know, a critical race scholar, she's a, a legal professor, um, called intersectionality, which is about taking account of our multiple, the multiple ways in which our identity is formed. It, it's not just that you are, say, African American or Chinese American, but being a Chinese American woman or man of a certain class, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which identity is created in a matrix. And that's a finding of critical race theory. These are important things. They've just been branded, you know, that's a term that's around, okay. but I, it's a totally miss, it's a, it's a um, straw dog, if you will, or straw man. It's, uh, 
it's thrown out there as red meat. Okay. People there. think it means okay. something that it doesn't mean. It just means being honest about the history and the systems. And Thank you for sharing. And being complete. That's my take on it. I'm not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Dr. Duval, the first time I saw Anne Foley's name was at Museum of Chinese in New York. Oh, yeah. Uh, they talk about his uh, great uh, commencement speech. And yeah. I've become very interested, but I couldn't find much um, uh -huh. but, you know, information about him but until, you know, huh. until yeah. now. I saw now, that yes. uh, they had the, yeah. I saw the website for their exhibit at some Oh, point. okay. I, I want to forward uh, this today's recording to all the Museum of Chinese American. Uh, one is in DC, New York, San Francisco, LA, Chicago. So all the people I know, I will forward to them. Maybe, okay. I hope they can have an uh, exhibition or, or talk, more talk about it, about uh, Yan Fo Li. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate um, y'all as an audience, first off, because, uh, you know, like I said, as an academic, you work on your little thing. <laughs> and, you know, you don't sort of look up sometimes. You go now up this is, this yeah. is where you make the social impact. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Dr. DeVoe, maybe you should have an online class that we're going to promote your class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, that's true. Oh, you you can go TED. Do you want to? Do you have a plan to go TED, Doctor uh, Duval? You mean a TED talk? Yeah, TED talk. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, you know, and Matt Lee. I've got to get a I've got to run, but thank you very much for inviting me and uh, my brother, okay. and my mom on, and um, hopefully we'll stay in touch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for bringing your mom too. Yeah, yeah, was, <laughs> yeah it's good to see you yeah. all. Good to see you all, hear your story. Touching. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, okay. good night. Thank you. Okay, good thank night. You. So, Cassie, thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, thank so, you. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Cassie, thank you. 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 Uh, we have like, we we we'll have a hundred twenty five at times. So I mean, I think the given people we can look at the, the Zoom statistics. Like we over two hundred people registered. So yeah, it was so a link. That's right. A mm -hmm. lot of people have a conflict. They have other webinars. They are resolved. Well, no, but, they, but, but they insist to yeah, get yeah. A, to get a recording link. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Duval. You're welcome. Okay, Duval. So, my mic. So, thank you. And uh, this is a wonderful. Thanks for wonderful. opening up our, you know, really yeah. open up our eyes about the, you know, the past. And now we look at the current. And then maybe that's actually, I think, a Cassie often believes that whatever we did with the history will help us, uh, you know, move towards a better future, right? So, That's yeah. That's the idea. And I'm getting yeah. message, people are still insisting for you to write a book. I oh, said, yeah. you have to talk to Dr. Duval, it's not up to me, you have to talk to Dr. Duval. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, right. so, let me know what the next steps are, whatever you need all right. to do. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I will con uh, communicating with Cassie, and then she uh -huh. will have the info, and then I think, uh, why don't we, Cassie, why don't you, you know, still be the point of contact with Mike then, yeah. All right. That sounds okay. good. Follow up. All okay. right. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Chen Ming. So Ming is our tech supporter. Yeah, Ming, thank, thank you, Chen Ming. I'm going to log off now. I'm going to leave this to you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. All right, take care, everyone.